December 12, 2018. We're in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, Blockchain Institute of Technology, waiting for Stephen to get here, and we're sort of chatting before mm -hmm. our human action study guide book group commences for chapter one. And uh, we plan on doing these once a week and uploading them. Yep. We're just going to have our own conversation. I'm not really talking to the camera, we're talking to each other. But I wanted to give a, a brief introduction to what these videos are and what we're going to be doing. Um, going through the book in a year, you know, it's a little over a year's <coughs> worth if we do one chapter a week. Yeah, how many are there? Um, 39, so I'm sure there'll be some parts that will go by slower. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, so there aren't as many as I thought. Well, anyway, I was just saying to you, Brandon, that um, I was amazed at how basic and simple the first chapter was and uh, how it's like sort of contradictory because it was also really dense and tough to read. Like I had to read the same paragraphs over and over mm -hmm. even on really simple concepts because of the way it's like worded it was, um, well anyway, I guess yeah. we'll get into it. Uh, I mean, we can wait for Steven, it's fine. Yeah, I mean, he'll, yeah. he'll jump in here when he gets here in a few minutes. He's over next door with every week. Okay. Um, I was saying before that, because I'm starting to think about what I want to teach for this course. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I start with Bitcoin and I keep going further back. Like, you can't, you have to teach what money is. You have to teach what uh, share economics is. You have to go through all this. Yeah. Um how people decide, and how human it is to decide, and how, like, cause and effect, like, humans are the only ones who can really analyze cause and effect, and just so, all of that most basic stuff, like, it's almost weird that they put it in, that he put it in a book for people to read, because it's, like, so obvious and self-evident, but it's also foundational and important for... The, like the study of economics and how people decide to do what they do. Right. Well, we're also we're using this study guide by Robert P. Murphy, who you should follow on Twitter for some hilarious tweets. But also, he's uh, really good um, at explaining these concepts, and he teaches some classes on Mises.org. And so, we're using this uh, study guide to go through the book. I've been listening to the audiobook on Audible. I have a physical copy, but um, to be honest, I always fall asleep when I read it. Yeah. It's so dense. And hearing um, hearing uh, whoever it is reading, Jeff Rickenbach or someone else, mm -hmm. uh, makes, it, makes it a little easier. Yeah, see, I always fall asleep listening to the audiobook. Oh, really? The and I, actually, I had about an hour car drive back and forth yesterday, yeah. and so I got a chance to listen to an audiobook, and that helped when I was in the car. The audiobook to yeah, supplement the book? Yeah, I mean, I'm in Portsmouth, and go back and forth to work here, so I'm never in the car. Uh, so when I'm listening to an audiobook, I'm sitting at my house, or lying in bed, or... Right. It's a more relaxed environment, you're like... Yeah. Not as engaged. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, but so I got through most of it in the audiobook, and then I found that the parts that I listened to the audiobook and then read, it was easier to read and understand after I. Um, yeah, so. hey. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. Speaking of concentration while reading this book, I really had to concentrate. It was not like a book where I can sort of listen to the audiobook and like put it on one and a half speed and just fly through it like i had to sit and analyze every sentence and process it with my brain it wasn't like a story it, it was i don't know i found it a little difficult well what you said about doing the audiobook audio book first it gives you like a quick pass and you right. can't think about it yeah because you can't uh, stop yeah but your brain like gets used to the words yeah kind of the direction of mm -hmm. it. Yeah, because it's hard for me when I read and I see like these words I'm not used to or give no meaning of. Yeah. So it's kind of it's hard for me when I read. So you have the whole thing? Yeah. Wow. 
Which edition is that? I haven't seen that one before. It's the Ayn Rand cover edition. Yeah. <laughs> It's helpful for me. I, I hate reading off of uh, like an iPad or tablet, and I don't. I like to read the words too. I don't like to just hear it. Well, so this study guide is great. Yeah. And they, <laughs> excuse me, they have study questions at the end. Yeah. Ooh. How would it be ideal for us to go over the study questions in this? Conversation? Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, they seem pretty. I'd say that was, that's what we should do. That's what we should do. Yeah. yeah. So the first section is purposeful action and animal reaction. Um, like, I guess to summarize, basically, purposeful action is trying to achieve. Like something you're consciously doing versus subconsciously doing or unconsciously. Um, Correct. A goal. Working towards a, a an intention, a goal. So, they define praxeology as uh, action for means to an end. Right. Is yeah. that the definition? So. I guess the psychology part maybe starts a little bit before the means, is how I interpret it. Like you, you do an action, um, and then psychology can answer maybe why or how you did it. But the praxeology starts at the means. In actually performing something? Well, so it says what distinguishes praxeology from yeah. psychology. I understand that psychology is completely mental. So uh, it's like, how do you choose your goal? Or like, why do you choose your goal? Is within the realm of psychology. Um, but then how do you pursue the goal and actually do something is outside of your head. this is an answering the praxeology question, but you always think as like, it could be an action or an inaction, like the negative, the absence of an action. Um, I don't think that's too intuitive uh, when you think of like means to an end. You can also choose to do nothing, and that also is an action. Yes. As long as there is an end in mind. Right. Like, if you have an end in mind and you think you're going to get it by doing nothing, that's acting. Mm -hmm. um, right? But if you have no end in mind and you do nothing, you're just doing nothing. Right. Why doesn't action consist merely in giving preference to something? Well, I, first of all, this kind of highlights why you can never believe what people say they prefer. Oh yeah, because people will say they prefer one thing but then act another way. Like uh, we experience this all the time with people saying that they um, prefer cryptocurrency and then they never use it and it tells me that they actually don't prefer using it. Or they, they don't prefer it. It's revealed in their action. So I guess in this case giving preference to something is stating preference to something. I think that's what the, the actual chapter said, is stating that, uh, that you're going to do something or that you want to do something is, is has nothing to do with action whatsoever. Yeah. Unless it's part of the action. Like, it's a weird kind of feedback loop because, like, you know, I could say I'm doing something and that could be like the start of an action. Like it, I could try to be manipulating something 
by stating something like unintentionally. So I feel like that's a gray area. Like if I don't know, I want everyone to leave or something, I could say I'm going to leave and maybe that gets you guys to leave eventually. Like stating something could still be an action. Stating your preference for it? Stating your preference. I guess then it's not your preference if it's part of the action. Well, how do we define action? It's like, uh... Employing means to achieve an end. Okay, so in this case, you're saying would the means would be uh, using your, your statement of intention to get the end of, of other people. The, the difference in this case would be like, <clears throat> if you stated, I prefer to be outside than inside. But then you stay inside. Yeah. Then right. That that preference is not action. Right. Okay. That makes sense. But also, I would, I would, I often redefine the word preference anyway as not a statement, but a revelation based on action. So it's like, yeah, like people your only really are... prefer what they do. Okay. You can't believe what they say. Right. Preferences seem to be revealed by your actions. They can't, they can't be um, stated ahead of time. I mean, they could be, give you a clue as to what someone's preference is. They might even not know what their preference is until it's time to decide. And then their preferences are really revealed. Or maybe is the, is the goal your preference? Like, the desire that you have? Is that your ultimate preference? Let's see what he says about this. I think the, the third part of this section basically says it all. What does Mises mean by action is a real thing? Mm -hmm. So a thought of a thought of acting is not real. Right. Yeah. I think they throughout the chapter they talk a lot about the bridge between like the material world and the abstract world. And so this is kind of where action is kind of where the two meet. Like you have this preference that's abstract, and then you have you know the material world, and they talk about a dualism where um, we just have to make the assumption that the abstract world is completely different than the materialistic world, and I feel action is a way of you know trying to create that abstraction in the real world. Section 2. The prerequisites of human action. What's always the incentive for a man to act? And so I actually wrote these down because I thought they were pretty important. Um, you have to have three of them. You have to have an unsatisfied state. Right. You have to have a, a vision of a better state. Mm -hmm. And then you have to have the belief that action will take you from that first state to the second state. So something has to be making you uncomfortable. Right. And uneasiness. Yeah. Like the, the it's in summary, the pursuit of happiness is always the reason behind action. It's like I'm always trying you're trying to be happier. Whether you're pretty happy now and perceive you could be very happy or like uneasiness suggests to me that you're like miserable, but you could just yeah. be, you could be doing great and just want more <laughs> um, because you can envision a better. Often I've heard that the distinguishing characteristic of humanity itself is people's 
ability to try and improve their situation. Yeah, well, he also says in the, in chapter one that one of the defining char characteristics of the human animal is the recognition of the um, correlation between cause and effect. The fact that we know that we can improve our station by action itself. And that was the third prerequisite. Right. I imagine it's completely impossible to attain happiness if you don't think you can make yourself better. Like, if you see no options for action, then you can't even imagine happiness. Yeah. So what about, like, the paramedic? When they shoot up, is that happiness? Yeah, I don't think so. But in this case, happiness is always defined as satisfaction of the desire, the goal. Mm -hmm. It and may not be rational. No, it is rational. It and is. That's, yeah. So that's another thing. I don't know if they're going to talk. Yeah. Yeah, they talked right. about rationality yeah. it, versus irrationality, but I had confusion about that. See, that's your, that's your straight. opinion that it may not be a good idea. But in pursuit of their goal, it is rational. Because their, goal, their goal is to feel the feel of heroin pumping through their veins. And they know that if they go buy it and use it, put it in a needle, then they will achieve that. Mm -hmm. And their discomfort now is that they, they know about that feeling and they don't have it. The sort of... Um, yeah, jumping ahead, I see the, the, the question is, why must the term rational action be rejected as pleonastic or redundant? Because all actions are rational, by definition, by like, uh, a priori, or whatever the, the expression is, where if people are choosing to act this way, then they have made a rational decision somehow. Whether you... Your opinion is that it's rational or not. They, their opinion is that it's, it's rational so the, because they took that action. The concept of rational <clears throat> is more in, in that you've compared possible uh, means to an end. Mm -hmm. So you have a logical, purely logical path from a mean to an end. Yeah. And you've, you've like measured one versus the other. As far as means goes, and compare which one is more effective. Right, okay. Um, and so a lot of, I know there's this whole like thought process in economics, um, in mainstream e economics, where <clears throat> one, there's really basic um, things they might teach people in school that like people are rational, like there's rational consumers or rational markets yeah, um, assuming a rational market. Yeah, that everyone is always doing the most productive thing, and then yeah. um, there's huge criticism of that. And then there's this, this whole other group of the mainstream which says people are not rational, uh, that they're irrational and they make poor decisions. Mm -hmm. um, and that, like, I totally see that coming out of, like, people in Boston in particular, and, like, uh, lefties who want to who like want to take care of inferiors, like people who aren't as smart as them. Mm -hmm. so they say people are being irrational, and they like reject, oh yeah yeah they reject this idea. Of, we have of, to protect like, these people who don't know what's good for them. Yeah, by making their decisions for them. Right, and so um, that first of all is really annoying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I guess what they're saying is not that they're irrational in the Misesian sense, but that they are inefficient uh. in their employment of means to achieve their end. So they don't have yeah, efficient means. Mm -hmm. But they're still weighing options. Okay. What are the general conditions of human action? 
Are those the ones that yeah, you Yeah, I think used? maybe I jumped a gun. You covered those. Yeah. What were they again? Um, unsatisfied state, uh, the vision of a better state, and belief action will take you from the first state to the second state. So you need imagination. And belief, which are the, which... And faith, I guess. Different. Right. So pretty much everyone can feel discomfort. Um, and I think probably more people can have imagination, but not everyone. So I think I think no, everybody everyone. has imagination, it's because you know if you have to go to the bathroom, you you still have the vision. Oh, I'm gonna go to the bathroom over there, or yeah. you still have vision. I'm just gonna go right here. <laughs> <laughs> well, unless you're not, you unless doesn't... you don't act at all, but it just comes out, and that would be just an animal reaction. Right. True. Yeah. I guess babies don't make that decision. Yeah. I, I think, think somewhere they said that, you know, discount just babies from this whole right. they're not they're not really humans yet. Or I don't know how they phrase it. They're not I I forget what the terminology they use. I'm pretty sure you said human. Oh really? Well because, <laughs> because they probably because not they don't people. see cause and effect the way that a uh, slightly older person right. right like you they don't recognize that anyway uh, why is it tautology to declare that a man's unique aim is to attain happiness what is tautology a tautology is uh, it's redundant it's a uh, it's like definitional. Self evident. Yeah, so it is definitional. It's like, um, yeah. Okay. It's a complete metaphor to tautology. The saying of the same thing twice in different right. words. Redundant. Generally considered to be a fault of style. They arrived one after the other in succession. <laughs> <laughs> So saying the same thing twice. So why is it a tautology to declare that a man's unique aim is to attain happiness? Because every time a man aims at something is to attain happiness. This kind of goes against some like traditional viewpoint of the word happiness also, in a way, because you could like let's say you really enjoy being sad. And like you you really Right. Really it's more like satisfaction of a Satisfying, yeah, I guess so. Satisfying a need rather Achieving than... Achieving a goal. Because not everyone loves to be happy. Some some people love to be but sad. But maybe you were thinking of, of like gleeful or joyous and, and this like happiness in this realm is simply satisfaction of a goal. Yeah. What distinguishes man's behavior from animal behavior? So I actually highlighted this because I thought it was pretty important. Um, so a man renounces the satisfaction of a burning impulse in order to satisfy other desires. He's not a puppet to his appetite. A man does not ravish every female that stirs his senses. He does not devour every piece of food that enters and entices him. He does not knock down every fellow he'd like to kill. Mm -hmm. So. A man or a human can suppress immediate instincts and desires for longer term goals. Wow, yeah. They can override <clears throat> some to pursue others. Yeah, they actually use the override. Another great um, example in the book is how a man can choose to give his life for a cause, which an animal just doesn't do. Mm -hmm. um, right, they don't. Or politics or religion. They don't have like this greater cause where they would give their lives. That just can't, an animal can't do that, that we know of. This is an interesting, um, another way of looking at rationalization, rational. Because not only do, people, do they weigh um, which are the best means to an end, but also in, in choosing to act, you've decided to pursue certain ends over others. Um, so, like, 
you said, they choose to pursue one end versus either going with a base instinct or another goal that is not being pursued. Mm -hmm. So I think that's another way that people are rationally, rationalizing, rationalizing when they act. Here's a comment. Human action as an ultimate given. Quote, as human action cannot be traced back to its causes, it must be considered as an ultimate given and must be studied as such. It cannot be traced back to its causes. Considered an ultimate given. In the chapter they talk about, he talks about dualism being something that this philosophy accepts in that um, there are like because we don't understand the actual physical, mechanical reason why people choose things, like um, then it's it's treated as a given that they did they just are. We don't know if it's like totally mechanistic, where it's just atoms and molecules and, and like gravitational forces and all of that, or if it's something outside of this realm altogether, mm. or what it is. I have a, to like bullet this section, I don't know, I just wrote, is there a God, and then dash, doesn't matter, we can't answer it. So like, is there, yeah, I think that's exactly what you just said, is there a mechanical reason, like is, but we can't answer it, so it doesn't matter, we just have to accept dualism. Yeah. I like that because it gives us an answer so we can just move on and like study other things that we actually can answer. So it's like we just got to accept for the sake of the rest of the book that humans have free will and they choose to do things. Well I think what it's saying is it doesn't matter if they have free will or not, that it, it still lays a foundation for the rest of economics that they are choosing or like the molecules are doing one thing over another. This is how it happens. Yeah. This is what happens. Whether they're choosing it to or not, this is the reality. And that's why it can be a given because it's universal. Mm -hmm. You answered this earlier, why does the term irrational imply a value judgment? You were talking a little bit about uh, preferences and uh, what is rational, where a person um, in Boston may want to choose for someone else uh, what kind of health care or whatever they have to pay for or receive, and they do so because they think that the people that they're deciding for are making irrational choices. When they're just not the choices that they would want to make, it implies a value judgment that they're making a bad choice. Well, it may also be an incorrect choice. Like, yes. they, like the person who they, they say is irrational could very likely look at two choices, one that is definitely more efficient, <laughs> and choose the worst one. That's yeah. Like, one that's less efficient. Right. Um, but they're still rationalizing the options. Uh, Okay. Right, but like this over this is greater than this over this, as far as a, a ratio goes. Mm -hmm. But they might just choose it wrong anyway. Okay, yep. Yeah. Or maybe they don't even know the um, a more efficient way. Why can't an action that is unsuitable for attaining a certain end qualify as irrational? I think we already over that. Yeah, Stephen just answered that now. Why does the objectivity of our science lie in subjectivism? Why does the objectivity of our science lie in subjectivism? Yep. So to rephrase that, because one's subjective preferences are what determine their actions, and those actions can be studied objectively. So it's saying that it's an objective fact that <clears throat> all 
people have a subjective preference. Yes. Okay, that makes sense. And their subjective preferences are what determine those actions. Well, and but most more importantly, well, yes, indirectly, but their subjective preferences are what determine their goals and, and which ones they pers they decide to pursue. Mm. So, like, you've got a lot of things that you want, and you're going to rank them based on the ones you want most, and then within each of those, you're going to choose which actions to take. Mm -hmm. Causality as a requirement of action. In what way does causality influence human action? We, we can't make a decision without it. We expect a different outcome. Like, we know that there's cause and effect, therefore, we want the effect. We make the action that is the cause to that effect. Isn't that basically it? Would it be fair to say that it would be irrational to pursue a cause that you don't believe would have the desired effect? I think that would, yeah, I think that would be the, a fair use of the term irrational in this context. Yeah, I think you'd have to qualify the word believe. Because I think some people, some people know their action isn't going to lead to their goal or their end, but they do it anyway. So belief could be subconscious as well. Right, but otherwise, but are, that is possibly irrational behavior. So you're saying subconsciously they believe that what they do, they their subconscious preference is revealed by their action, even though their conscious preference might be irrationally acting. Yeah. Well, I guess here's the answer from the book. Okay. Causality is necessary for action, because without understanding cause and effect, an actor could not hope to alter the flow of events and thus increase his happiness. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle and other developments in modern physics do not alter this. That's a, that's cool that he includes that. I think that's like the third requirement for action too. It's the no, the belief that the action will take you from your first state to your desired state. Yeah, humans understand causality, cause and effect. We want to increase happiness, therefore we make actions to, that are the cause of the effect that we want. But I don't think, like, it's not, you have to consciously think about it in order for, for it to be action per se, I think. Yeah. Well, you, the things that you do subconsciously, like is breathing is considered action. I don't know. I, th I feel like that's uh, considered instinct. So you're not thinking, like, I need my blood to be filled with oxygen. I would agree in this context. It seems like action is, um, here it says, every action is a choice where the actor selects one alternative that he prefers to another. So in the context of human action, Oh, yeah, breathing is an action in English, but in this context, actions are things that one chooses to do. So I could see a problem, like, so that narrows down the scope of what action is. But then there's a lot of things that you do that are probably driven by your subconscious. Yeah, yeah, like without thinking. Yeah, I'm sure there's things that I do that I don't really even realize I'm doing it because I have some subconscious goal. Yeah. Yeah. But I think that you have to separate from are the goals conscious versus subcon subconscious versus the actions. Like, because if you have a conscious goal, then your subconscious is definitely going to act on achieving that goal. Like, if you tell, I mean, <clears throat> I guess if you tell it to. I would 
think but involuntary mechanisms like breathing and blood pumping just don't qualify as, as action. So what if I am looking for love? Yeah. Subconsciously. Yeah. Maybe consciously I'm not. And what if my actions reflect, like my, I do things subconsciously that, you know, when a girl walks in and you stand up straight or something like that. Yeah. Um, like, what is, like, that's an action and it's driving me to do something. I would say not action. It's, and it goes back to, like, animal instinct. And, like, you're especially talking about a girl, which is, goes down to breeding and yeah. procreation. And th those things are just, like, default, you're a mammal. You're going like the default is to do these things that your hormones drive you to do. Yeah, those don't seem to me to be. While they're in English, they're actions. They don't seem to be the type of action that is a human action. It's uh, an animal action. So what if it wasn't a primal thing? Maybe it's. I'll spend a little bit more money to like. So now what if he's a consumer? And it's not, you're, he's still making an action to like maybe procreate, maybe he's showing his wealth. Right. And so that's out and that's affecting like markets and stuff. Yeah. Because he's acting on this subconscious instinct that. But what's the goal in this case that, that uh, he's trying to achieve? To show his wealth. Or the goal is to attract a, a me. So I would say if he buys a car that's more expensive and showy with an intention of being attractive to mates, then that is a human action because there, there's an intention behind and it. And an awareness of he, causality. But if he does it without knowing that he's, that he's doing it for attractiveness, then it's an animal action, not a human action. Yeah. And if he does it without being aware that it's going to achieve his goal, that it's not in this under this definition a human action. Mm -hmm. Like you have to both have the goal and know that what you're doing is going to achieve it. I think everything here, the goals are definitely within the realm of conscious thought. Okay. Why is it inevitable? In order to act, to know the causal relationship between events, processes, or states of affairs. If a person falsely believes in a casual, in a causal relationship, can this allow for action? Yes. Yeah, they can. It's a very inefficient action. Well, <clears throat> okay, so to repeat, why is it inevitable in order to act to know the causal relationship between events, processes, or states of affairs? Because an action like you just talked about, you have to know that getting a, a nicer car or a nicer whatever is going to attract the mate. You have to know that there's a causal relationship there in order for it to be in to be acting. Otherwise, it's, it's it's not an action. Even if you're doing the same action, <laughs> so not to use the same word with two different meanings. Because um, if a f person falsely believes in a causal relationship, can this allow for action, like a tarot card reading? Like if you falsely believe that if you, um, I don't know, give someone a potion, can this allow for action? Did you say yes? Because e even if it's false, that's still a human action, even if it's not a true causal it has relationship. All the, it has the prerequisites. I think it, you have to think that you know the causal relationship. Right, yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't think the... I think it's irre irrelevant whether they, the causal relationship is true. Right. It just has to exist. <laughs> yeah, for it to be a, like a human action. We perceive a cause and effect. 
And we take an action to try and get that effect. Even if it's stupid. The Alter Ego. Yeah. Section 6. How does praxeology deal with the problem of the analysis of other people's actions? So how does praxeology analyze others? This is by far the hardest section for me to read. So it says here, all events must fall in the realm of teleology or causality. That is, all events must be ascribed either to the intentions of an actor or to the mechanical unfolding of physical law. Many thinkers are prejudiced against teleology. How would you say that? Teleology. Teleology. But on their own terms, the positives, positivists must admit that the assumption of the alter ego, that is the assumption that there are other wills, just as one is aware of his own will, is very pragmatic. It works better than to simply view the bodily movements of others as the complex outcomes of chemical processes. So that's how it deals with other people's actions. Okay, it's so you could you could assume that you're the only consciousness and that everyone else around is just moving because of inertia and all the things that they do. Like one thing I'm kind of thinking and struggling with is imagine a person back to your like you get a car in order to show that you are like suitable mate. Mm -hmm. What if you're raised in a world where like you just you're around people who have nice cars and get mates easily. And then you see people who don't, and you don't make a conscious decision to like act and do that. You just kind of get the car and then get the girl. Right. Um, that like, I could see that person as not acting at all. And then they're just, events are unfolding based on like physical properties of the world. But their neighbor might be might like perceive they like they're like how how do I get a girl like I'm struggling to get a, a wife and then they see well what if I get a car then that will give me a wife uh, that person might be acting whereas the other person who maybe just like instinctually does things they're not acting at all um, so I guess deals with that and that some of the things other people do are going to be action and some of the things they do are going to be animalistic or, or instinct instinctual yeah at first it would seem that an animal's instinctive behavior is a middle ground between teleology and causality yet instinct is simply a term to describe the motivation of which we are ignorant Okay, so we can't know what the discomfort is of other people. Yeah, we are ignorant of how or why other people act, what their motivation is. So we don't and know. We call that instinct. And we don't know their goal either. Right. Per se. We know their actions. we can assume that sometimes they're rationally acting. Yeah. Like standing up straight when a girl walks in. We may be ignorant of our own motivations or the motivations of others, but if we were cognizant of them, we would call that a, a rational action. We're like, I'm going to be as like upright and handsome as I can be whenever a girl walks in because I am like consciously looking for a mate. I think that would be two, the same action but with two different, uh, one is instinct and one is human action. Fair? So, how does this deal with other, I guess I'm not really saying where it ties together with a 
there's people. So if you do that, so the problem is that, so how does it deal with the problem? That I don't know your motive, or I don't know your ends. Right. How, like, how do we solve this problem? Like, if I'm trying to analyze, okay, Derek just stood up straight, why? I guess it assumes that all people are, that? Are, are making rational decisions for themselves. Regardless of whether or not we know their motivations, uh, all of So, actions. the analysis would take the assumption that you're staying up straight for your pursuit of happiness. Yeah, that sounds right. Sounds right to me. Maybe we'll get an answer from more further questioning. Uh, what are behaviorism and positivism unsuitable for the ex? Wh oh, why are excuse me? Why are behaviorism and positivism unsuitable for the explanation of the reality of human action? Behaviorism and positivism being I don't have those written down. Find definitions of those. Yeah, please. I think positivism is a mechanistic view of the world, perhaps, that um, positivism is the theory that laws are to be understood. Um, oh. philosophy system that holds that every rationally justifiable assertion can be scientifically verified and it rejects metaphysics and theism. Say it again? It's, it's a philosophy that every assertion can be scientifically verified and capable of logical or mathematical proof. So that's I think the idea is that um, assuming that the interrelation of chemicals and electric charges and molecular and molecules and forces are sufficient to explain why people act or why people do and move through the world. Um, behaviorism is the theory that human and animal behavior can be explained in terms of conditioning without appeal to thoughts or feelings and that psychological disorders are best treated by altering behavior patterns. Hmm. So, why are behaviorism and positivism unsuitable for explaining reality of human action? I think the first with positivism, we, we touched on that at the beginning, that we don't understand the exact, um, we can't explain why people decide things uh, on, a, on a physical level, on a mathematical level. Yeah, both of these things seem to totally discount um, people's intention, which we don't always know. Behaviorism is totally correct that like patterning behavior will make you just do things automatically. But, but not but, all. But, but like you can choose to pattern your behavior also. Say your, your behavior is in one way, you can still act to, to change it. It says, without appeal to thoughts or feelings. The theory that human and animal behavior can be explained in terms of conditioning without appeal to thoughts or feelings. So, so when I hear conditioning, I think of uh, training your subconscious. You know, Pavlov's dog salivates when it hears the bell. Right. Um, and human, that's not a human action because when you start to salivate when you hear the bell, that's not a human action, right? Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah, I guess you could, I don't know if there's tears, but like if some, some of the things I do, I chose to do a long time ago and then I created a pattern. And now, like, my physical being just does those things. I would like, say the conditioning is the human action, not the action itself that you conditioned yourself right, to do. Right, so, like, I conditioned myself to do yoga every day. Yeah. And, like,
like sometimes I just I'm just in yoga. I'm like, I, I don't even <laughs> think about knowing yoga. I'm just there. I didn't tell anyone. Yeah. Um, right. Okay. So the conditioning itself is the action. Yeah. in the field of human research? Okay, teleology is defined as the explanation of phenomena by the purpose they serve rather than the postulated causes. So teleology says that things happen for a reason. And I think within the field of human study and human action, you can explain action based on a, their purpose because people have things that they want to achieve. And so that would be their purpose. This seems like a simple concept, but can you make it explain it to me like I'm five? <laughs> um, I guess the difference between teleology and positivism is like... No, uh, causality. And I know, well, then it's not saying the oh, differences, okay. but positivism says that things happen because they are this way. Okay. And teleology says things happen because someone had a reason for them to happen. All right. I think like within the field of human research, it's clear that people have reasons for things. Like people want things, desire, like, per like conscious desire seems to be totally obvious. That people think I want this. so. And then assuming people are acting all the time to achieve their goals, you can look at the outcome of all that action as having been caused by the purpose for it. Okay. Thank you. We have to wrap in a couple minutes. I actually have to head over right now. All right. Um, yeah, I, I wish I could finish. Um, but this is really good. This is definitely helping me understand what I've read. Yeah, I'm gonna go, now that I know how we're going through this, I think for the next chapter, chapter two, uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and make notes and like try and answer the questions ahead of time and then yeah. when we talk about Good it, thinking. we will be even more prepared. That's great. Yeah. yeah. So, All right. Yes. Peace, Brandon. Have a nice night. See you tomorrow. Or Can praxeology learn anything from animal psychology? I'm not convinced that some animals don't have uh, purposes, like and goals, and they like are thinking thoughts. I mean, like, why? How are humans even thinking in the first place? Like, yeah, and the, uh, some animals seem to have at least a certain level of consciousness. With the example being like mischievous animals, where their their purpose seems to be like to delight in causing harm. Like cats who are like ready to just knock something off the table because they're like, oh, 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 oh this is gonna piss you off. Oh. Stop it, stop it. And, and, uh, like, what purpose does that serve for their reproduction or whatever? It just seems to be like delightful. Um, I don't know. Okay, well, this was fun. Yeah. Was wait, wait. First class? Yeah. Uh, this was a good first class, so... Chapter 2 next time? Yeah, chapter 2 next time, and uh, we'll do this again. Thanks for joining us.